Leanne? Yes. Are you there? I'm there. <laughs> hey, I think we are now live on Facebook. Um, we well, are. And I, I, do what? We are. Yes, we're live on Facebook finally. A few minutes late, but a uh, little audio trouble. And I swore I knew what I was doing this time around. So um, sorry. That's okay. We're we are here. It's, I'm uh, starting this web series, Funny Friends. And um, people always ask me, who makes you laugh? And I always say, my friends make me laugh. And many are um, professional comedians, but many are just friends in life that crack me up. But no one makes me laugh more than you do. Thank you, my darling. Well, you know that you and I both, we get so tickled. If I hadn't <laughs> had you in the last 15 years, I don't know what I'd have done. You've kept me alive. Because we, uh, we started together in 2004 with Southern Fried Chicks. Yeah. And now your career has like, you, to, in a lot of people's mind, it would be that 20 year overnight success where like you like blew up and overnight, you're like the hottest thing in comedy right now. Oh. All right, and you're with me every day on it. <laughs> you what now? It's been a wild ride and I, you've had to go every minute with me. Should I take these I, out? Should I leave them in? <laughs> I need to leave them in. I can hear you better with the man. Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, you've been with me. Yeah, it's been a wild ride since October. And it really, and, and like I said, we've been working together since 04. And before we even started working together, you, how did you get started in comedy? Tell people that story. Because, you know, I went the traditional route of, you know, going to open mic and a comedy club and, uh, but you had quite a different uh, beginning. Well, I always knew that I was going to do um, something in show business, but I didn't know how. And I went to University of Tennessee and I um, just didn't have the confidence to, I think there was a comedy club in Knoxville, the Funny Bone maybe, where, um, Oh, a lot of people came through like Steve Harvey and all that, but I had no, Henry Cho, people like that, but I had, I didn't even know it was there, but I just didn't have the confidence. Anyway, I marry and have my first baby and my husband moves me to Bean Station, Tennessee, and he's got a used mobile home business and he doesn't chant and I am lonely and I want to make my own money, but I want to stay at home and nurse my first baby. And so I start selling jewelry out of in people's homes in their living rooms. So I go and lay all this jewelry out, schlep this big case around, <laughs> and I um, make and you know people make a dip and a and a deviled egg sometimes. And and I was supposed to be talking about jewelry, and I was and instead I was talking about breastfeeding and hemorrhoids and how resentful I was that Chuck didn't hear the baby crying in the night and people thought I was funny and somebody peed on a couch one night and I knew I had something and I always loved stand-up comedy but I, I had it in my mind that I was going to be Julia Roberts which is stupid because I never took an acting <laughs> class but anyway I kept, I kept thinking I was going to be a starlet anywho um the company noticed that I was booking so far in advance and they asked me to speak at their big regional and national things. So I went and I did it a couple of times and women would just come up to me and say, you need to be a stand-up comedian. And so that gave me the confidence to then try it. So, um, you know, I didn't come up in comedy clubs, but I did horrible gigs at the Morristown Hamlin Hospital they would say, would you come in here and do a, a little something? And they would pay me with a tray of hospital food. So I, and they were sweet, it. but you know, it was <laughs> awful. But anyway, I then I did all that kind of stuff. Like I had three babies real close together. And I, was, and I thought, I'm going to be a comedian. I just know it. And I started doing like a one woman kind of thing, one woman show at a little sandwich shop in Morristown, just stuff like that. 
and stuff yeah. at the Rotary Club. Like the Rotary Club would say, would you come and do, you know, and I don't even know if I got paid. I bet you I didn't. And, um, and then we sold that mobile home business and moved to San Antonio. And that was when I had a club. And that's the first time I, and I went down to Austin, Texas. San Antonio didn't treat me right. They made me get up in the middle of the night when everybody was high on marijuana. And um, <laughs> I was talking about T-ball and doo-doo and um, people were high. And, uh, and I'm shocked I didn't quit. But then I drove down to Austin at Cap City and did Chick Stick. And Margie, who still runs that club, believed in me and moved me from opener to headliner for the first time in their history. And that was the first time I ever headlined. And, and I had not featured maybe two or three times in my career. And I had horrible diarrhea all week, wanted to die was hoping somebody would shoot me on stage. It was <laughs> scared, most scared I've ever been. Oh, but I, I made it through it and, um, you know, and by the time I did that, I somehow found, somebody found me for the Southern Fried Chicks. And that's when you and I met. And right. I, you know, I, I really feel like that was when people say you're, you become seasoned over, you know, working all the time that I was like the opener for y'all. I went on first and that was my time. I think that I got, I honed my first 45 minutes. And we did about 50 dates a year there for a couple of years. I mean, it was like, and I remember we were working in Winston-Salem in a theater, it's 1300 seats. And when we pulled up, they had sent a car for us at the hotel. We pulled up and the line is wrapped around the building of the theater. And we both go, oh my gosh, who's here? <laughs> we didn't realize it was for us. And I know. It, well, I thought yeah, it was, oh it, no. I know. That's what we so that that we had so much fun on the road and back then reality tv wasn't what it is now but we've always said we should have gone around with a camera and got some of the behind the scenes stuff because the booking agent put us in all kinds of places and i'll never forget the uh the show what it was in tuscaloosa alabama and the green room was about the size of this computer screen and we were all jammed in there and we do they do what we call a, a writer where they send ahead what we want in the green room whether it's a fruit or you know vegetables whatever we want anyway the the lady there at the theater had taken it on herself to cook pasta uh for <laughs> for us and leanne's getting ready to go on stage and she sticks her head in that green room and goes somebody's gonna have to stir this pasta <laughs> it was gonna burn yeah, and Leanne goes, well, I'm about to go on stage, but I'll stir it. <laughs> and I'm so thankful you did because I was about to panic. Like, how fast do I stir it? How long do I stir it? I don't cook. I don't know anything about this. <laughs> I know. Wasn't that crazy? But everywhere we went, there would be a big um, spread of food. And oh, yeah. people were good to us, you know. They, I remember that pimento cheese that had jalapeno in it. That little man okay. from Wilmington, North Carolina. And uh, oh. most of the time, people had wonderful things for us. And, and then later on, when we toured with Trish in Country Co, you know, people would bring Kentucky Fried Chicken. She wouldn't eat it. But no. me and you ate it. Yeah. I, I, I've never turned down <laughs> no. anything. I have no, loved it's not everything. Fun. I have lo I I free, loved it. Do one. I said, like being on a plane, you'll eat things on a plane you wouldn't eat off a plane. I mean, it's like it's free. They're handing it out. I'm taking it and I'm eating it. Yeah. So, you know, we would eat anything in there. And Trish was much more health conscious than we, <laughs> than uh -huh. we were. She sticks to her thing, but honey, I don't. You're talking, you were talking about how um, you always knew that you do something in show business and it's, it still just makes me laugh so much. I think it was, you said it was your uncle, what he used to say to you about going to Hollywood. Oh, my little uncle Raymond. Uh -huh. He would say, gal, you could do Vanna White's job. You need to go and turn those letters 
And I knew in my heart, I thought I could do what Vanna White is doing. And I look at her today though, and that little frail thing, she's tiny. She's kept her weight down. I don't think I could have done that. You know, I look, I, I could have done that. What uh, something's coming up on my computer, Java something, but I could have, uh, I thought I could have been Vanna White, but then I, I look back and, and I needed something, a job where you don't have to be very disciplined because I'm not, you know me, look at, look at this Diet Coke. I said I was gonna get off of it. Steak and shake, look at that. Shake. That is as big as Karen. <laughs> but yeah, my little uncle Raymond believed in me and my little mama would say, you got, you're gonna be in show business, I just know it. You can do anything you want to. And she would say, you can, I bet you could take pictures pretty. You're photogenic because you've got hair on your arms and blonde hair on your face. And, and Marilyn Monroe did, and that's why she photographed so pretty. Now, I don't know if that's true, <laughs> but Lucy, I would say, oh, you've got hair on your face. You're gonna be able to make it in Hollywood. You know, and I, and I was so stupid. I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> But I still live in Knoxville, Tennessee, and it's crazy. You've been through every television deal I've had. You know, I've had a lot of opportunity in Hollywood. You and, you know, people always say, move, you need to go to New York or LA. And they don't say that now so much because the business has changed so that, you know, with social media and everything's more global and you don't have to be there necessarily anymore. But back then, I mean, it was hard to have a career and really, certainly get a tv deal with without being in new york or la but you've had what three deals three television deals three yeah and nothing nothing has ever made it to pilot but yeah the first one with abc paula dean was going to play my mother and um the writer strike hit and you went through that depression with me i i thought that was my first rodeo and i thought this is it. I'm going to be Ray Romano and Roseanne. And, um, and you know, I've, uh, that didn't make it. And then I've said many a time, I'm quitting. I'm quitting. I'm going to work at Target and I'm going to put bedding up on the back. I've always thought that'd be a fun job. <laughs> and then right when I think this is it, I'm quitting. Then I got the deal with Fremantle and that um, produces American Idol and my writer was Matt Williams, who created Roseanne and Home Improvement. And we're still wonderful friends. I love him. And we wrote a script and that got sold and, you know, fought over by Nick at Night, TV Land, then ended up not making it. And then now I have one with Sony. And um, I just don't know. I, you know, who knows? And I've, I've told you, I think I'm too tired to have a television show. That my friend Hugh knows Reba McIntyre, and she said during her when she filmed her, she, some little man in Malibu had to put IV in her arm and pump vitamins in her because it was so hard. I just that don't know awesome. if that's what you know <laughs> is meant for me. I used to yeah. think it, but I don't know now. Well, it's nice to have that interest anyway. I mean, you know, but you know what I hate about it is Hollywood always wants to put you like you've told me they always want to make your husband in the in the script you know uh, with a car on blocks or something and Beautiful. an executive and and they always want to play to that stereotypical south which makes me so mad i could kill somebody because we have that that's so not what the south is I mean, there's oh, no. parts of it, but there's parts of that stereotype all over the world, but the South gets blamed for everything. <laughs> I know. And they always want to name my kids weird names that I don't need, like Branch, you know, and I don't, <laughs> you know, I, and that they didn't get to go to school, you know, just crazy mess. Yeah. And I, you know, but, but Matt Williams, I mean, everybody, I know. Um, I know. you know, it's been sweet to me about it and tried to do what you know, I wanted. And once they get to know me, because I know I sound, I'm very country. So I think when people first hear me, they think I'm out here living in a tent. <laughs> people always Camper. think I've got, I've got big curlers in and a moo moo on. And sometimes <laughs> it's true. 
<laughs> well, and then you even have some somebody say something to you like, you mean y'all have hairdressers or, you know. And, yes, and y'all have hair salons. I mean, I don't even know how to <laughs> respond to that. <laughs> I know. How many people have I come home and said to you, I had to say, have you heard of Vanderbilt? Right. Uh, there, there's a little place down in Alabama called NASA. Have you heard <laughs> of that place? <laughs> Everybody's not stupid. I know. Uh, I know. And I've had people say to me that if people have shoes on. Oh, my gosh. I know. Just crazy. But anyway, Hollywood, you know? uh, we've always said they they say all that but then they're fascinated by us you know they're fascinated by people oh, yeah. in the south because we're pretty fun we are fun and what you know when you think about some of the greatest shows ever andy griffith i mean come on andy griffith i know we watched it andy. last night and it was the episode <laughs> where aunt b was on the jury and i and chuck was like i gotta go to bed and i and jack nicholson was the was on have you seen that episode with aunt b no. and, and she gets jury selection and she's freaked out yeah, she's and fine. thinks she's going to be locked down and opie's worried and goober they all go <laughs> with her and it's jack nicholson is the guy that's being charged that's on trial you and he was jack. beautiful a young jack nicholson he was darling Anyway, I didn't get to see what happened because Chuck, I think Jack Nicholson got off, but but Chuck was like, I gotta go to bed. But we yeah. watch Andy Griffith every night. Yeah, I know it's so funny. And you know, and Andy always uh, outsmarts the city folk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the people but from Mount still still Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a sweet show but you know but back then though there were so many, many things set in the south and they weren't they they weren't stereotypical i mean they were sweet shows but now everything you know they do with the south i don't know they they do it in a way designing women was was good but since then i don't know but anyway we'll have to see what they do with leslie jordan oh and yeah Paul. so funny so, so funny, funny yeah um hey everybody you know your whole thing is you're pretty much an open book and i think everybody feels like they know you which is a lot of your appeal beyond just being so funny you know and and first let me just preface that by saying when we would go um when we'd be after a show, me and Trish or, or Ed and May, whoever we're working with, we're in there trying to sell merch, doing this, and you're over cornered by somebody telling you stuff that, I mean, that their husband's in prison because they embezzle money from the Pizza Hut. I mean, I, it just, <laughs> the stuff people tell you. I mean, it just kills me because I would be like, of course, I'd be like, oh, well, I'll pray for you, where you'll get every detail. <laughs> I know, and you know, I want to know. I want to know. And I'm sorry that I did not help y'all at the merchandise table. Oh, no. That's okay. but I, I, because I know there were, there people would be covered up 10, you know, deep, and then somebody would say to me, uh, I've just had a hysterectomy, and uh, I've, whatever. I don't know, you know, all kinds of things, but I wanted to be a therapist. I've told you that and I've tried to analyze yeah. you and you've had to hear me analyze everybody on the phone when I've been in a gown drinking coffee after the Today Show. But I wanted to be a fa child and family therapist if I was not going to be in show business. But I've tried to do both, but not without a license. And so <laughs> I, I have loved, I love observing people and I love to hear about what people what's going on i love human behavior and so i've, I've always seen it if i if i went going through brain fog and menopause right now i'd go back to school but I, somebody'd have to, i'd have to pay somebody to write my papers because i'm so clueless and crazy but i wish i could i, I wish i'd have got I, I wish i'd gotten a master's in that because i think that would have been but you know when you i observe my family and myself and my and, people and that's where my comedy comes from so it's kind of like therapy kind of 
Well, and and you have a genuine curios curiosity and interest in what people are saying, you know, and, and that's a wonderful thing. And you are so observant and can pick out those tiny little um, characteristics and then recreate those on stage. And, you know, that's when uh, old people going to concerts, that's what made that so funny, well, so funny. You. And that's the clip that blew up that really kind of changed your career, don't you think? Yes, and you know, Karen, you you and I both did Dry Bar, and Dry Bar right. was a good bump. It was a good bump for our career, but it did not sell tickets. I don't know why, but it just did not translate in ticket sales. And and we've both done a lot of corporate and a lot of private events and right. churches and women's events and all that, and that's been wonderful and a blessing. But it, it just did not translate in ticket sales. So my social media people put that video out and you know i shot that with y'all in chattanooga and i had never done it before i just got up on stage last. the one and that was year before last when we were at the walker theater so that yeah. was a year later that video yeah. was a year later yeah and that was the first time you ever did it on stage correct yeah i yeah and i just I just did it off the top of my head because I just come from that concert. Chuck and I had just been, and um, and so I did that. I it wasn't even a bit. I mean, I just told that story. We got it on film, which you know is so unusual to get something halfway decent on film. Oh yeah. And then, yeah. and then my social media people put that out, and I was in New York with. It was the first thing, first one or two clips they put out these boys that I hired because I, I and I didn't know how that was going to go. And I was in New York moving my youngest into school. Uh, and I and I looked at my phone and I, I saw the numbers going up and I thought, huh, you know, something's happening with this. And but I just did not realize what it was going to. It was shared so many times, I guess, that it, it got such a, um, a more of a following than I've ever had. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, it, it's gotten what, 18 million views or somewhere up in that, I mean, crazy numbers and, and, and the following you've gotten since then. And, and it just struck a nerve, I think, with people, you know, and, and I'm going to try to play this clip through, I mean, this is technology I haven't used before, so I may come back in just a second and go, sorry, that didn't work. Let's keep talking. But I'm going to try to play a piece of that clip real quick, and then we'll talk about it on the other side, if I can make this happen. Okay. Um, all right, let me see if I can. Old people that are older than I am, okay. We went, and I thought, oh, we're going to have a fun day, and he, and I said, where are we going to go out to eat, and he goes, I don't have time for that, it was on a weeknight, so he went to the pilot and bought himself a tall boy, and I think that's what it's called, and an egg salad sandwich from the pilot, and so I didn't get to eat, and I was so hungry, and it dawned on me at a concert, you know, when I was 20, and I'd go to a concert, I was at U University of Tennessee, and so I'd go to Thompson Bowling, wear a crop top and I didn't care about eating. I wasn't hungry, you know. I was thinking hey, what boys were gonna be there and I had on little bitty britches. Because I still had a metabolism and my thyroid was acting right. Okay. So we go to Def Leppard and Journey and everybody there is our age. And and everybody's worried about the snack bar. First of all, and I was too and I was so hungry, and I and I noticed that people had big Diet Cokes, like big buckets of Diet Coke, and were <laughs> sucking on those big buckets of Diet Coke. Well, the okay, I just pulled it up. Once in a while, Sorry. somebody would stand up and... <laughs> And then they sat back down. <laughs> okay, so you heard it, but you didn't see it, correct? Right, I just heard it. Okay, so sorry, folks, I I, I screwed up, but uh, you're supposed to see it on the screen, but you did hear it. And um, 
So funny. You know, the part of that that makes me, that kills me the most is uh, Chuck getting a tall boy. <laughs> that always just makes me laugh so hard. But those are I, the little things. <laughs> well, you know, all of my married life, he has said, I'll meet you there. I have never ridden in a car with him. I've had three <laughs> children by him and we've never ridden in a car. I bet I can count on, on two hands that we've been to some event in the same vehicle, except on Sundays going to church. And that has been a holy nightmare. He and I do not, I begged him, <laughs> do not ride with me. Do not drive me to church. You're ruining everything for me. I can't even, I can't even feel the Holy Spirit because you are so hateful on Sunday morning. But anyway, we all fight real bad and that's Satan. But, um, but he's always said to me, I'll meet you there, Lynn. I got to work. I'll meet you there. And that, and I was so hungry that night at that concert. And, but everybody, everybody there was eating a big gob and drinking big Diet Cokes. And, and it just, it just was so funny to me to think about when I was, you know, in my 20s or in, t in my 18, 19, I was at UT and I went to all these concerts like Tina Turner and, and Elton John and uh, John Cougar Mellencamp. And I would be in a little outfit and I'd been smoking and I was, I, I, it was just so different. <laughs> but now when you go and we were tired and we were, you know, can we make it through this? And then... The, and, and I just wanted something to eat and then you feel like you need to stand up and dance but you really don't want to and because you're tired but the the and and it also struck me how bad the boys in Journey and Def Leppard look <laughs> everybody looks so bad and everybody <laughs> around us look bad I mean you everybody was just old so it you know, it's just so funny to me. And Lord, Mick Jagger's what, 77, 78? Well, I know. And and you can go see somebody you, you've loved your whole life. And then it get, at a certain point, you're you're like, oh, I'm going to have to get out of here. What time is it? We got we, we to gotta go. I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Um, I was I, like, I, we, I remember thinking, we got to get home. What in the world? Everybody was like, by then, racing to get to their car. It was... But that must have resonated with people. Yeah. Oh, I think so. I, and and everything, you know, you have the podcast, Sweaty and Pissed, and everything that that you've, you've talked about, you know, timing's everything. And I just think the perimenopause and menopause, old people at concerts, you know, because we're just a group that's not, it's kind of like never say die. We're not going to be elderly the way a lot of our you know our parents and people have felt not I don't maybe elderly is not the word but but you know what I'm saying they we're going to keep going as long as we can go and try to be youthful as long as we can but at the same time we're going through the this stuff and yeah. we want to talk about it and we want people to to that we can relate to um that can make it funny that helps you know, it helps everything, whether yeah, it's well, cancer or menopause. <laughs> if you can find humor in it, then that's, you know, the way to go. Yeah. Well, and you, you know, when I started that podcast, I just thought, because, you know, my perimenopause was bad. You went through it with me. <laughs> and I just, I wanted to know what in the world I wanted to feel better. And I thought that everybody I knew wanted to, too. And nobody knew how to, you know, they didn't know how to check for hormones right and a lot of doctors didn't get that in medical school OBGYNs didn't and so I I just said I've got to know and I have this nurse practitioner who is brilliant and who knows about and studies hormones and so um it just seemed like the natural thing for me to do but a lot of my comedy too you know my old stuff is all about having children and I just think you know there's you know most people have children and I don't know why, but oh, boys are easier to raise than girls. Like there's just things I've talked about. Hormones. <laughs> uh -huh. And girls, you know, hit you in the back of the head with a backpack and a minivan and, and when they get home yeah. to school. I, it's, and things like that. The, the material, that old material I thought was going to be 
the stuff that catapulted me. But, and I've often told this story when I was on um, uh, Funniest Mom in America. You know, I'm always the bridesmaid, never the bride. I never win. I'm the only stupid contest. I never win. But anyway, I hate them. But Jeff Ross said to me, Lynn, you got to do the bit about one leg out of the pantyhose. And that's about me and Chuck having to have sex in a closet so that <laughs> he'll be sweet at church and then buy, take us out to lunch after it's over with. So, and I was so worried because my kids went to a Christian school and, and I love that school. And they were, they were like, we're going to shut down school and we're going to show all the little children your set on Nick at Night. <laughs> And so I thought, I can't do the bit about Chuck and I doing it in the closet before we go to church and taking one leg out of my pantyhose. So <laughs> I didn't win. And I'm glad I made that decision. You know, that would have yeah. been awful. So <laughs> anyway. Yes, it would have been. Um, okay, yes, it been. <laughs> yeah. Well, all of your comedy has been pretty much what you're experiencing at the time, whether it's raising kids or going through uh, menopause, whatever it is. But tell us something, because your life's such an open book uh, on stage. What is something we would be surprised to know about you? Well, I've thought about that. And <laughs> I, and I, this may be lame. It's may be very, very lame. We talked about, okay, you were saying, you, did anybody ever know that I smoked cigarettes? I smoked cigarettes in the early 80s <laughs> behind a dumpster. And when I was at the University of Tennessee, I loved them and I'm ashamed. And, but my people <laughs> grew it. My people were tobacco farmers. And, uh, and not everybody smoked but a lot of people did. And so anyway, I, and, that, and I was waiting tables and all the cool girls were smoking anyway. But I, I think that people, because they, I know people are scared to get up in front of people to speak. And they, what if, what if the experts said people would rather die than get up and speak in front of people. And I think that people probably think I'm really bold and uh, fearless because I am a stand up and I get in front of a lot of people. But I, you can probably tell them that I am very, very sissy and I'm scared of my shadow and I can't, and you know, I'm not scared about getting up in front of a bunch of people and I can talk about breastfeeding or taking a one leg out of my pantyhose or whatever in front of a bunch of people. But I don't, you know, I'm scared of everything. I'm scared of, I don't like a roller coaster, an amusement park. If you go with me to the amusement park, I'll hold your purse, but I'm not getting on a roller coaster. I, I don't like skiing. My Chuck's mate tried to make me snow ski for years. I don't like speed and, and scary. I don't like scary. I don't like to start anything new. I don't like to um, try something new. It's very, it's hard for me to that kind of stuff. Did you know, you knew that about me though, because you've had to drive me around Yes, I, you, well, you just, you, yeah, you're sissy when it comes to driving and that kind of thing. <laughs> but you're always so appreciative that I'll let you go to the bathroom. So, <laughs> I'm like, you always let me empty my bladder. Yes, I Thank will. Thank you, I, little K. I always I need you too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Chuck would go, You don't need to go. Hold it. And I'd be, Oh, but I'm very sissy. I'm scared of things. Like if, if you said we're going to a haunted house this October, I mean, like I would, it would give me, I would break out in hives. I don't like anything, even though I know that's not real. I know that's yeah, right. not real. I'm sissy. <laughs> that's not, is that, I mean, that's probably not very interesting. I also thought about this when I was little for fun, we went to the funeral home. That's something interesting about me. My mama, wow. <laughs> my mama couldn't drive till she was in her forties, early forties. And so we would walk down to the store and um, that my family owned, but she'd say, let's go walk down the store. And on the way, the store was the funeral home. And she got, oh my gosh, somebody's in the funeral home. Let's go see who. And so we went just would you would have shorts on and we'd just walk into the funeral home because we knew everybody it's a town of 500 people and so we went to the funeral home for not for fun 
but to socialize. Yeah, did yeah, you take, and, a, take a jello salad? <laughs> yeah, oh, if Lucille known, yeah, if, if she knew somebody was in the funeral home, oh yeah, she'd take a plate of food. But um, but I've never been scared of funeral homes. I, sissy as I am, I've never been scared of that, but I, it was like I was raised in one. I wasn't like Trish was, but I we went in, we went all the time. And it was nothing. It was like, oh, look, there's Mr. Herschel laying there. It never bothered me. My mama <laughs> would be like, oh my gosh, we, she'd have a ball. But if Mr. If Mr. Herschel popped up out of the casket and then you're, you know, that would scare you and you and mine. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, that's the haunted yeah. house element of it. Oh, yes. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Well, we're coming up this Sunday is Mother's Day, and um, and I know just like me, I, I help with my mom all the time. You help with your mom, and uh, as so many other people our age are are helping, you know, take care of parents. And um, do you have a a funny story about your mom that you could share in honor of Mother's Day? Oh gosh. Yes. Okay. There's so many because I've got a funny. I know. She's so funny. funny. I love Lucille so much. Oh, Lucille is so funny. And let me tell people that she can dazzle. You know, oh. all my life, we, if we went to a Tupperware party, everybody wanted to see what Lucille was going to say. She, everybody wanted to be friends with her. Everybody wants to be friends with her now. She dazzles. But um, I remember, okay. I was raised in a little bitty tiny Methodist church that they still go to. And it's probably a hundred people and sweet, sweet, sweet. And everybody has their own pew, you know, that you sit on. We sit on the same pew for years and mama is very observant. And this is terrible because she loves the Lord. But it, we would get so tickled at church. Like she would see some, like the choir director's socks. And she would look at me and I knew exactly what she was thinking. And we would, and my sister did too. And we would get so tickled and we could not stop that we'd shake the bench. And my dad would get so mad. <laughs> but okay, so we, we went out to eat every Saturday night before we had church on Sunday morning. And um, my mama, and I'm just like her, Karen knows this, that I cannot waste food. Okay, we went out to Vernon's. It was called Vernon's and on Saturday night. So we're at church the next morning and my mama smells something and she whispers to me, Scotty Reed has messed in his britches. <laughs> okay, the Reed sat right behind us and they were, be they were beautiful people, sweet, beautiful. They had a little baby and she went, oh, messed in his bridge and we were like we get in the car she gets in her purse to get out a cigarette I'm sure to smoke after church and she goes oh my gosh Scotty Reed did not mess in his britches that's that chicken and dressing from last night I forgot all about it and we thought that was the funniest thing and I my mama has kept everything every piece of food wraps it up in a napkin puts it in her purse and I, if, if Karen, everywhere you and I have ever been, have I went in the green room when they have had a little dab of fruit, have I said, I'm taking it in my purse? Yep. You, we can't leave anything. You can't leave take. anything. And uh -huh. I, I have got, I've got enough to feed a family in my purse right now. And look, <laughs> we're in a quarantine. What am I, where am I going to go? But I've always had a snack, haven't I? I've, but oh, yeah. I'm Lucille, honey, but that turkey, and it was turkey and dressing or chicken dressing and it's spoiled and we thought it was Scotty Green's dirty diaper. <laughs> but <Yeah>, anyway. mom. <laughs> <laughs> my mom's always wrapping up something from the table to take to the dog. And that's what we, <laughs> there was always some little piece of turkey or something that had to. Yeah, and you probably uh, take that for your little dog now, don't you? The street when we got <laughs> no not so much now but <laughs> um <laughs> sometimes um another thing is your mom uh that the story i love is that she loves weather oh loves weather wanted to be a weather <laughs> person 
They want. And y'all go get in the bathtub. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, they live right in the tornado. I don't know if you call it tornado alley, but when you know Middle Tennessee gets a lot of severe weather because they're. I don't know if they're on a plateau or what's different there, but it's different from me being yeah. in Knoxville. I'm I'm in a valley. We don't get it like Middle Tennessee. But growing up, my mama would just be fascinated by a cloud. She'd say it's a cloud. That's another word for tornado for her. And she'd go, oh my goodness, the cloud's coming up. Let's go get in the bathroom. And she would sit on the toilet and smoke. And my sister and I would go in there. And uh, and I just think about it now. I was raised in 1,400 square feet. And it's a, a, a Thank you, Lord, that that house was not just whooped up, but we would be sitting in the bathroom and uh, I'd get in the bathtub. Mom would be on the toilet. Beth would be looking at her face, you know, in the mirror doing, and, uh, and she's six feet tall and she'd have her leg up on the, on the uh, vanity and we would just sit and wait for a tornado to come. <laughs> it's a wonder it didn't kill us. I mean, and, we, and my mom would just be so tickled. Oh, a cloud. <laughs> but that's, that's Lucille. She, it, 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 she makes the best of every situation. I mean, she, she's like the most chill person I've ever met about everything. I know. I know. I know. I know. There's one time she got mad at me. And, uh, and I think she was trying to, talk, to count down from 10 backwards. Like there was a, a commercial on TV that would tell people to count, if you get angry, count 10 down. I think she's seen that commercial because I was acting like I was camping. I always was doing commercials when I was little because I wanted to be in show business. So I would be in the sink, you know, in the bathroom doing like I was doing a product or whatever. And I was out on the front of our porch and I was acting like I was camping doing a commercial. And, you know, this is the hot dog that whatever. And I set a bush on fire, one of her shrubs on fire. I had a real campfire going. Oh, and she wasn't, let, you know, back then in the seventies, nobody paid attention to what you were doing. I mean, I was, I constantly had a campfire going or I was doing something crazy. You know, I'd bike 20 miles away from my house. Anyway, her eyes glassing over and she had to count back down but she never I didn't get in trouble she got over it you know oh that's a shrub it's gone no you know she she's been a good mama and that's how you've always been too you've been really you know laid back with your children and for the most part all, for the most yeah. part I think they know that like they push 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 and I'm okay until you push me far enough and then I'm shaking and then they, they know that I'm mad, but it takes a lot to get me mad. Yeah, I know you are so uh, happy go lucky. And Charlie is, I think the most like you in terms of uh, he's got your accent, he's got your curiosity about people. He can tell a great story. And he, he's and what I love so much about Charlie is that he'll sit and talk. He'd sit down and talk to a ninety-year-old man, and not just to be nice. He would has a genuine interest in what he has to say, and it's just such an, a charming and endearing quality that he has. Just such a, a doll. you know what I, all my kids love a middle age to elderly I mean like middle-aged people you know my kids love adults ever since they were little you know oh and that, and Maggie always says she she could run the White House I mean that girl is on it and so much fun and Tess um she and she's the one you talk about uh in the cheerleading bit about working like a choke <laughs> but she uh, just finished uh, makeup school in New York for film and television, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she she really would like to be in New York or LA and not living at home with her mom and daddy during the corona. 
I know it. I she's know my aunt, honey. She doesn't want to be here, but. Oh, and she's so good at, at makeup. She's done, I mean, my makeup, the best it's ever been done is when she's done it. But she can also make you look like you've been shot in the head. So, I mean, she can do bullet holes and everything. So I know she's got a big career ahead of her. But anyway, I, I appreciate you coming on with me, Leanne. I'm all, um, uh, I hope you'll come back again and, and visit with me other than just on the regular telly. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh this Sunday, Mother's Day, and I know being a mom is how important that is to you and, and how much you love your children. So I hope you have a, a wonderful day with them on Sunday. Thank you, little Kay. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for doing it. <laughs> I've had a good time. Right. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Bye, Leanne. Bye-bye, my darling. <laughs>